Horses, are they tools or pets? My early introduction to horses was not a joyful one. In my family, horses were tools used to work cattle. The only reason I sat on one, other than the fact I was a miner and did more or less what my parents told me, was being carried around the landscape was far better than walking around the landscape. I did have a few smarts in my early years. I still believe a horse is merely a tool. But unlike a hammer, you can't just leave him where you last used him. While horses won't rust like hammers, they do require significant care and maintenance. Here are a few of my experiences with horses. First, if you want to ride a horse, you have to catch a horse. This is much easier said than done. It's a little known fact that horses are telepathic. When they glimpse you out of the corner of their eyes, walking to the barn, they can immediately tell if you're coming over to feed them or to catch them. If the former, they will meet you at the gate like a long-lost friend. If the latter, they will bolt for the farthest fence line and hide in a rock pile or a briar thicket. This necessitates ranchers getting out of bed at daybreak so they can get their horses saddled before lunch. Sometimes, if the horse is young and dumb, you can fool them by shaking a can of oats. Horses can hear a can of oats shaken up to five miles away and will sometimes come running back, thinking they made a mistake and it must be feeding time, not work time. If, when, you capture the horse, the next chore is sliding a bit into his mouth and the bridle over his ears. Most horses think you're trying to shove a large manzanita tree down their throat and they push back with their tongue. Getting the bit past a horse's tongue is similar to placing a cat into a tub of water. How can something so small provide so much resistance? Next, if you've been successful, you must brush off the inch-thick layer of caked mud and marsh grass that smells like the only toilet in a diarrhea ward. He rolls in this herbal cachet to keep the flies from biting his sensitive skin. Once clean, you can throw the sweat-soaked horsehair caked blanket last washed during the Harding administration onto his back. With the resiliency of molded plastic, the blanket has formed fit to the horse over the last few decades. The saddle comes next. As you swing the cumbersome saddle up and over the horse's back, he usually takes two steps away from you, so the saddle lands on nothing and the stirrups swing down, smashing you in the shins. Yes, horses are just stupid animals, but that is most certainly a big smile on his face. Which reminds me of a joke. A horse walks into a bar and a bartender says, Hey, why the long face? Get it? Oh well. Once, while saddling my horse, the saddle slipped off his back and swung down under his belly. Well, the horse thought a grizzly bear had attacked his ticklish parts and began saddle bronc maneuvers to remove him. Jumping into the air and kicking with both hind feet, it wasn't long before he destroyed enough leather to remove the saddle. My Uncle Gene used to tell a similar story. He had his own horse as a youngster, a gentle old buggy horse named Pet. Like most other families during the 30s Depression, the Whitney outfit was poor. Young Gene got the hand-me-down, almost wore out, cinch straps from his dad. He recalled more than once riding along on old Pet, and moments later, Cinch parted, finding himself on the ground, with his gunny sack of squirrel poison spilled all over the place. He was five or six years old. Pet stood by patiently waiting for him to stop crying. Eventually, he brushed himself off and led Pet all the way home, barefoot, leaving his cinchless saddle behind. Anyway, once you get the saddle in place and begin to cinch it tight, you will notice the horse taking a deep breath, like he's suffocating from you choking the life out of him. He's not in any real danger. He just does this so, once mounted, you will roll off when he exhales, which is why you either ram your knee into his gut as you tighten the cinch, knocking the air out of his lungs, or you can lead him through the barnyard, out the gates, and down the roadways, until he can't hold his breath any longer. When he exhales... Thinking he is one, you grab that cinch strap and yank it like you're towing a semi-truck at the World's Strongest Man contest. 
Now it's safe to mount without any fear of falling to the ground. Always mount your horse from the left side. Why? No one knows why. That's just the way it's always been done. Horses are big, powerful animals, and I don't want to find out what happens if you mount from the right side. But if you're curious, feel free to try it. Lastly, be sure to adjust the stirrups so your butt is free of the saddle when you stand up. This is more important for boys than girls, especially when the horse begins to trot fast. As you mount and ride away from the barn, you will notice your horse's enthusiasm, or more likely, his lack of it. His head is slung low like his best friend just died. His pace is glacial. Step, Mississippi. Step, Mississippi. Step. At this rate, it'll be dark before you find the nearest cow. And if you're not paying attention, he will plod in a semicircle until you're headed in the opposite direction. That's right, back to the barn. In sharp contrast, after you have moved all the cattle from field A to field B and turn in the direction of the barn, your horse begins high-stepping like a Tennessee walker overdosed on five-hour energy drink. Unchecked, he will accelerate to a trot, followed quickly by a full gallop. With a horse, you never have to worry about getting lost. He can find his way back to the barn quicker than a Titan missile with GPS. Kind of like Lassie. Except, when you fall off into a mine shaft and holler, Buster, go get help, he'll already be gone. And, unlike Lassie, you shouldn't count on help coming soon, unless there happens to be a human standing near the hay manger when he skids to a stop with the empty saddle. There are a couple of things to be aware of when riding a horse. One, horses are easily terrified. And two, most everything will terrify a horse, especially any quick movement. I found myself reposing on a dusty cow trail once because a stupid squirrel darted across the trail in front of us. One moment I was astride a horse, the next moment I was sitting on thin air. Sure enough, my trusty steed was awaiting my return at the barn manger in hopes of getting some oats before calling it a day. Another time, my dad finally trusted me enough to send me out on my own to bring in some cows and calves. When I got to my assigned area, it was midday hot. So I climbed down, tied my horse to a tree limb, and sat in the shade of a bushy live oak tree for a drink of water. A lizard must have had the same idea because he came racing across the rock surface like a bullet. The next thing I know, my bridle is swinging freely from the tree branch in rhythm to the sound of fading hoofbeats. Another long, hot walk back to the barn. My grandpa thought it was amusing enough to record in his daily journal. Another tip, watch your horse's ears. When they're laid flat and to the rear, he's mad. Most likely, it's you who made him mad. My advice, stop whatever you're doing and dive out of the way. Another thing about horses, they have to chew on everything. If left to their own devices, they will chew themselves out of a corral. My grandpa mostly cured this problem by pouring creosote on all his corral lumber. He used to soak his fence posts in barrels of creosote to keep them from rotting. And while creosote discourages horses from chewing on wood, it stinks, and like all petroleum products, it doesn't wash out of your clothes. Around 1970, my dad and I were helping Ailey's brand some calves. My dad parked his brand new cattle truck in the horse pasture near the corrals with the other neighbor's trucks. As we climbed in to head home, he noticed the tops of each door where you rest your arm had been stripped of paint. Seems we had left the windows rolled down and the stupid horses had chewed the paint off inside and out. Horses. This was the way it was always done on the Whitney Ranch, until the Industrial Revolution arrived at Horse Creek. I had purchased a Yamaha 250 Enduro. I hauled it up the ranch to ride it around. One fateful day, my dad said, let's saddle up a couple of horses and gather the Creekfield cattle. To which I replied, we here. I'll be back with the cattle in half an hour. I jumped on my bike, zipped out into the pasture, and pushed the cattle into the barn in minutes. My dad, never at a loss for words, was speechless. 
Soon, there were two Honda Trail 90s sitting in the garage, and later, three-wheeled and four-wheeled ATVs appeared. Hey, you don't have to feed machines. They're always handy when you need them, and they don't have attitudes. Of course, there's a few places a horse can go that a bike can't, but there are usually workarounds for these shortcomings. One last horse story. There's some rough country around Tharps Peak. A family named Carteret ran pack horses in that area during the off-season. When they sold their place in the 60s, I guess they left a few horses behind. Within a few years, there was a good-sized herd of wild horses running around up there. A decade or so later, Jim Wells and friends decide to round them up and get rid of them. Hooping and hollering like the wild bunch, they drove them off the mountain and into various neighboring corrals. I don't know what Jim did with most of them, but there was a wild mare and her yearling colt that ended up in the Whitney Corral. Over the next couple of years, they gentled down some and stopped tearing up the corrals, but my dad had no practical use for them. Meanwhile, one of my high school classmates, Cliff St. Martin, was the manager of a Big Five sporting goods store in Visalia. I ran into him one day, and he mentioned his desire for a pack animal to use on hunting trips. I told him my dad has just what he needed, and invited Cliff up to see the mare. He was interested. How much? My dad, brother, and I were planning our own pack trip into Mineral King. So we said, how about we just take it out and trade at Big Five? A couple days later, we're pushing a shopping cart through the aisles of Big Five, loaded with fishing rods, sleeping bags, air mattresses, 22 ammo, flashlights, etc. Manager's discount. I don't recall what a mare was worth, but it's the only time I remember a horse doing something useful for me.